Thank you all so much for coming out on this cold, icy evening, although it's balmy compared to yesterday. So, And thanks so much to Dave for inviting me. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. I'm going to begin from reading uh, from my series of map poems titled The Thymetry that use bathymetric maps to guide the language on the page. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about how I began thinking about the map as a poetic form uh, for this larger project and talk about some historic and contemporary examples. Uh, and then I'll finish by talking about the larger manuscript project that these maps are a part of and how I see it working as a whole. So just some brief background before I get started. Uh, these poems are split into three sets of four, and they move from the south to the north of Lake Michigan. And they are all titled Bathymetry because the language is laid over the bathymetric maps of the lake that measure its depth. These poems are the centerpiece of a larger poetry manuscript that is about my memories of growing up in Michigan and spending time at the lake, as well as meditation on the environmental history of the Great Lakes. I think of these maps as performance scores, which I'll talk more about, but I want to mention it now because I see the language moving into the depth of the lake uh, as a score for performers moving into the depth of the lake. I recognize that that makes this score impossible to perform, and I'll have more, about, um, more to say about that. Uh, but first, I want to take a look at the poems. Buries her dead, and buries her dead, and buries her dead and buries her dead, 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 and buries her dead. I lack, I add dust, I pour, I add dirt, I consume, I add nothing, I dream, it's okay. I mark the days, and then the weeks, and then the months, and then my body is never on pause. Buries her dead, and 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 buries her dead and buries her dead, and buries her dead, and wake, walk, find, go, burn, count, wait, gather, carry, breathe, list, write, add, take, gather, go, walk, watch, move, look, be. Open, continue, Fill, shed, hold, answer, shape, rest. Follow. Buries her dead, and 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 buries her dead and buries her dead, and buries her dead, and buries her dead. I call, I cry, I steal, I muster, I fail, I distance, I pour, I set, I splinter, I carry, I wait. I ignore, I rise, I filter, I breathe, I absorb, I smile, I weigh, I caution. I keep my desires and distances. So I wrote the first set of these poems in 2016 after a friend and fellow poet, Danny Snelson, reached out to me about submitting work to a project that he and the art historian Mashinka Hakopian were putting together in collaboration with the Block Museum at Northwestern. The call was for score-based work in the tradition of fluxus like Yoko Ono, and their goal was to publish a pamphlet series to complement an exhibit at the block on the avant-garde musician Charlotte Mormon. Fluxus has been a big influence on my work and on this project, so I want to spend some time talking about how this call for work uh, led me to these maps. 
The Fluxus Movement was a global avant-garde movement that partially grew out of a class taught by John Cage at the New School in 1958. John Cage was a mid-century experimental musician who was interested in creating music out of everyday objects and experiences. As an example, I want to show you this brief video of Cage performing his 1959 piece, Water Walk. water walk because it contains water and because I walk during its performance. Figures, isn't it? All right, now, also, two things I want you to notice. Over here, Mr. Cage has a tape recording machine, which will provide much of the... Will you touch the machine so we can know where it is? Which will provide much of the background. Uh, also, he works with a stopwatch. The reason he does this is because these sounds are in no sense accidental uh, in, their, uh, in their sequence. They each must fall mathematically at a precise point. So he watches his watch as he works. He takes it seriously. I think it's interesting. If you are amused, you may laugh. Uh, if you like it, you may buy the recordings. John Cage and Walter Walk. So as funny, as playful, um, you can see from that performance that Cage is using objects that you might found, find in your house, like a bathtub and a blender, uh, to create a scored sound performance. And it opens up the question of what is considered music. Uh, by creating this piece out of ordinary objects that make ordinary sounds, 
Cage is asking the audience to consider everyday noise as music. Cage was really interested in using chance operations to write his scores. Um, for instance, he often composed with the I Ching, uh, but the performance of his score is very tightly timed. Um, if you look at the score, There we go. Um, so if you look at the score, you can see how Cage was timing each of his actions, even though they seem random. So, you know, every five seconds, something happens. Um, and here's the, the second part of the score. Oops. Um, so this is kind of the basis of what Fluxus comes out of. A student of Cage's, the musician and artist George Brecht, developed something called the Fluxus Event Score. And drawing on musical scores like this for inspiration, uh, a Fluxus Event Score takes a simple form, the instruction, and combines it with performance to call attention to how small, ordinary actions might be transformed. Uh, the critic Hannah Higgins describes the Fluxus Event as everyday actions framed as minimalist performances or occasionally as imaginary and impossible experiments with everyday situations. Like Cage's performances, these event scores ask the participants and the audience to think of everyday actions as performances, calling attention to routines and behaviors that might otherwise go unnoticed. However, they also expand on Cage's principles to make the performances even more open to chance and circumstance and apply Cage's chance operations for music to all of life. Uh, so some examples of Flexus scores include Allison Knowles' Proposition and Variation Number One on Proposition. Proposition, make a salad. Variation Number One on Proposition, make a soup. Uh, so Knowles was a prominent artist in the Flexus movement, and in these examples, she is very interested in ordinary, everyday actions that we might not necessarily think of uh, as art. Uh, but by framing these ordinary tasks, as scores, um, Knowles forces us to imagine them as performances and think about them differently and more intentionally than we might otherwise. These are also domestic actions, which elevates work typically thought of as women's into performance. Um, this next example is by Yoko Ono, who never explicitly called herself a Fluxus artist, uh, but was involved in Fluxus and conceptual art. Uh, these scores are from her book, Grapefruit, which was first published in 1964 and is made up entirely of event scores. Here's an example called Map Piece. Draw a map to get lost. And Water Piece. Steal a moon on the water with a bucket. Keep stealing until no moon is seen on the water. Both of these scores are playful and contradictory. If you draw a map to get lost, for instance, you wouldn't necessarily be lost anymore. And if you try to steal the moon on the water uh, until there is no moon, you'll be there for a very long time. So there's an impossibility to these scores that lend them a whimsical, dreamlike quality. However, even though these scores would be impossible to perform, they force the reader to imagine how they might perform them and what it would look like um, if they were to perform them. So bringing that kind of imaginary play into the realm of performance. And when read along the Knowles scores, they also bring the imagination into the everyday. And so by merging the performance and the everyday, Flexus artists open up the everyday to political intervention. Uh, and we can see that at work explicitly in these three scores by Jackson McGlow, an experimental writer from the 20th century. Social projects. Social project one, find a way to end unemployment or find a way for people to live without employment make whichever one you find work. Social project two, find a way to end war, make it work. Social project three, find a way to produce everything everybody needs and get it to them, make it work. These open-ended scores have the impossible quality of the Ono scores by asking the reader to imagine how they might go about these performances. Um, and here the stakes are higher and the impossible aspect of them becomes a geopolitical concern. Uh, but like the Ono scores, McLeod is inviting these imaginings into the realm of the performance and the everyday 
uh, challenging the reader and the performer to make it work, whatever it is. By using this vague language, find a way and make it work, uh, McLeod is forcing the reader to think about what this would look like individually. So there's an openness and a playfulness to all of these scores. Even though they are using the form of the instruction, they're not telling you how to complete the task. That openness challenges the reader to bring their ideas to each instruction, which will be different for every reader. Each performance of these scores will therefore be different depending on who performed them. The emphasis on the mundane and the general allows for many approaches to both writing and realizing a Fluxus event score. The site specificity of each performance means that each staging will look different depending on who the performer is and where they are. Back to maps. So when thinking about the instruction um, as a form and score-based work more generally, I want to use a form, I wanted to use a form for the pro this project that would guide the language on the page for me as a kind of instructive force, which is how I arrived at using a map as the form. I grew up in Michigan and spent most of my adult life so far in Chicago. And because of that personal connection to the Great Lakes, um, I decided on these maps of Lake Michigan and I used the bathymetric lines to loosely guide the language on the page. I think of these map poems as score for performances. The language positions potential performers on the map. This ultimately makes it impossible because those potential performers would drown as they got deeper into Lake Michigan. Um, but I'm interested in the idea of the impossible performance as a launching point for a, a larger work that uh, imagines and interrogates memory and place. By using maps as scores, I'm also working in a tradition of map poems as well as with Fluxus. I'm drawing on the Fluxus score, but I'm bringing it into the tradition of the avant-garde map poem. And so I'm going to spend some time uh, talking about the avant-garde map poem tradition and the points of commonality between it and the Fluxus event score. So first I wanna look at a map poem that came out of the avant-garde movement, Italian Futurism at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Italian Futurism had an enormous influence on the avant-garde and experimental art through the 20th century and now, um, including on visual and map poetry. The trajectory of the 20th century map poem that I will discuss begins in many ways with Italian Futurism. And so it's important, I think, to start here. Um, in 1909, the writer F.T. Marinetti announced the beginning of Italian Futurism with a manifesto printed on the front page of the Parisian newspaper Le Figaro. He wrote that Futurism would focus on the new with an emphasis on new technology, machinery, and dynamism. And he developed what he called words and freedom writing, which used things like font and onomatopoeia as an organizing principle instead of punctuation and syntax. In his technical manifesto of futurist literature, for instance, he writes, we futurists initiate the constant audacious use of onomatopoeia. This should not be systematic. For instance, my Adrianopole siege orchestra and my battle weight plus smell required many onomatopoeic harmonies always with the aim of giving the greatest number of vibrations and a deeper synthesis of life. We abolish all stylistic bonds, all the bright buckles with which the traditional poets link images together in their prosody. Instead, we employ the very brief or anonymous mathematical and musical symbols, and we put parentheses indications such as fast, faster, slower, two beat time to control the speed of the style. These parentheses can even cut into a word or an onomatopoeic harmony. So Marinetti is describing how the pacing in his words and freedom poems will be controlled by sounds and visual effects uh, like on monopoeia and notations rather than more traditional poetic rhythms like iambic pentameter. And an, so an example of this is Marinetti's artist book, Zang Tum Tum, a visual and sonic representation of the Battle of Adrianopole in 1912 during the Balkan War. Marinetti was at the battle as a reporter and sent it as a letter to the futurist painter Rusolo. Here's an interior spread of the poem. It draws on onomatopoeia and visual spacing across the page to become a score for a performance. And Marinetti later performed the piece with hammers to mimic the sounds of the battle. The tradition of the map, th map poem then from the beginning was linked to the possibilities and problems of reading on the page and performance. And Marinetti's text doesn't give you instructions as a reader or performer, and he brings in everyday objects like hammers to perform it. 
As you can probably tell from this example, futurism glorified violence and war. Marinetti notoriously supported Mussolini and the fascist party's rise to power in Italy and eventually gave up many of his ideals to stay in Mussolini's favor. And then futurism disbanded after his death in 1944. But this kind of disregard for punctuation as an organizing force um, in favor of visuals, onomatopoeia, and spacing uh, becomes an important tool for visual and experimental poetry going forward. So this next example from surrealism doesn't use typeface or onomatopoeia in the same way, uh, but challenges traditional ideas around maps and information. While they were interested in many of the same artistic ideas as the futurists, uh, the surrealists fell on the opposite of the political spectrum in their support of Leon Trotsky and the Communist Party. Uh, this shows that the map home has become a kind of flexible device over time uh, that is used for a wide range of political projects in the 20th century. The surrealists emerged in Paris in the 1920s, and they were an avant-garde group interested in creating works that liberate the subconscious mind. They developed a technique called automatism, which in which one writes or paints without thinking and without lifting the pen or the paintbrush. And they integrated dreamscapes with realism. They defined poetry as a way of life. Uh, one could create poetry without ever having written anything just by living. And in 1929, they published this surrealist map of the world, which as you can see is a version of the Mercator projection but with much different perspective. Paris is in Germany, Labrador makes up a large portion of North America, and Russia and Alaska loom large. The equator is not a straight line. This alternate map is playful and fun, but it also presents a view of the world that is less centered on Europe and the United States. It imagines a world with different priorities than the Euro-centered world the Surrealists lived in, and asks the viewer to reimagine their priorities as well. It's an example of the way a dreamscape portrayal might interact with a realistic portrayal. Much of the map is recognizable, but in a way we're not used to seeing. And it's also commenting on a post-World War I landscape where borders are constantly shifting. So taking their cues from both the Italian futurists and the surrealists, the Situationist International were also interested in interrogating traditional borders, though on a smaller scale. Uh, like the Surrealists, the Situationists were anti-capitalists, but instead of being invested in the French Communist Party, they took Karl Marx's writings as a departure point. They viewed capitalism as having a destructive force on everyday life for common citizens and were interested in reclaiming it. Uh, so this is The Naked City by Guy Debord. It's a map created in 1957. Debord started the group The Situationists around the same time in Paris in the 1950s. You can see that there's some indebtedness to Marinetti here visually, but the Situationists had much different political aims, and so in many ways, Situationism is a departure from Italian futurism. One of their defining principles was what they called the derive. Debord defined the derive as a walk through the city in a way that attempted to change the way the city was viewed and inhabited. The derive translates to drifting, and Debord was careful to differentiate it from a regular walk or stroll. The situation thought of it as part of a political struggle to reclaim the city from capitalism and class segregation. In his theory of the derive, first published in 1956, Jabor writes, the lessons drawn from derives enable us to draw the first surveys of the psychogeographical articulations of a modern city. Beyond the discovery of unities of ambience, of their main components and their spatial localization, one comes to perceive their principal axes of passage, their exits and their defenses. One arrives at the central hypothesis of the existence of psychogeographical pivotal points. One measures the distances that actually separate two regions of a city, distances that may have little relation with the physical distance between them. With the aid of old maps, aerial photographs, and experimental derives, one can draw up hitherto lacking maps of influences, maps whose inevitable imprecision at this early stage is no worse than that of the first navigational charts. The only difference is that it is no longer a matter of precisely delineating stable continents, but of changing architecture and urbanism. The map, The Naked City, is an example of psychogeographical map that comes out of this kind of engagement with a city. The map features 19 cutout sections of a map of Paris, linked by directional arrows in red, and the cutouts in black. The map is a collage of a well-known map of Paris at the time, the Plan de Paris, 
it prioritizes a narrative of the city over a bird's eye omniscient view by linking parts of the city together by association rather than by proximity. This instead prioritizes the everyday experience of the city over the totalizing view. For DeBoer, this focus on the everyday experience was an important aspect of his political project because it returned the experience of the city back to the people who actually use it rather than city planners. DeBoer also thought of the derive as a performative act in that the action of walking changes the experience of the city. And so situations maps like the naked city have a scored aspect to them. Like the Fluxus artist, DeBoer is interested in considering an everyday action, walking, in the sphere of art and performance, and the resulting maps as a way to transform the experience of the city. Okay, so I'm going to transition into talking about some contemporary examples of poetry that engage with maps. Both of these examples come out of an experimental poetry tradition inaugurated by 20th century groups like Futurism and Situationism, but both are reorient reorienting their use of maps for the purposes of their own projects. So the first example I wanna talk about is the book Drift by Caroline Bergvall, published in 2014. The book comes out of an avant-garde performance tradition Bergvall states that the initial plan for this project is, quote, to write a text for live voice, percussion, and electronic text, end quote. And the book is split into 10 sections, including rewritings of an old English poem, The Seafarer, an old Norse poem, drawings, a transcript of a reconstructed narrative of the draft of a migrant boat on the Mediterranean, maps of the boat's trajectory, a log of Bergvall's attempts and failures when working on these projects in 2012 and 2013, and a meditation and performance based on the Old English thorn, which is an extinct letter that is a precursor to the TH sound in the modern English language. At the heart of Drift is the transcription of a narrative based on a reconstruction of the journey for the Left to Die boat, a boat carrying migrants from Libya to Italy in 2011 that was abandoned in the Mediterranean despite sending distress signals to authorities about their lack of fuel and food. All but nine of the 72 passengers died. Even though government boats and helicopters traveled near the boat, taking photographs, no one came to their aid. In reconstructing the journey as performance, Bergvall does not try to provide rationale or context that would justify the migrant's experience. Um, instead, she exposes the way the systems of borders and nations fail the people who require their protection. Discussing the project in her log, Bergvall writes, the forensic principle that every action or contact leaves a trace. I decide to use the narrative of the journey and its harrowing drift, the story told by the survivors and corroborated by the forensic findings. My role will be to shorten the narrative and relay the report's complex piece of memorialization, interpretation, and investigation through live recitation, to register the event by recitation, letting the recitation become a resonating chamber, a ripple effect. Resonance is contact ripple. Everything is connected in the vast chamber of the world beyond the callous, brutal politics. Everything ripples at contact. Bergvall draws on this report, published by Forensic Oceanography in 2012 as the basis for her performance. She includes a reconstructive map of GPS coordinates of the boat's journey drawn from the report. She also includes the following maps, uh, and I apologize if they're hard to see. They were extremely difficult to photograph. But the first is the drift model from the report on the left to die boat. The second is Othair's first voyage. Third is the London Line, the Northern Line, London Underground. Next is London to Geneva. This one's just called Zodiac. And this is the great wave off Kanagawa. These maps use the model of the GPS map from for the Forensic Oceanography Report as a way to connect the different threads of this project. By including these kinds of GPS style maps for so many disparate things, Bergvall places them all in the same plane, equating the trajectory of the left to die boat with the northern line of the London Underground, for instance. It also links several of the different ideas of the book, place and sense of home, navigation, journeys, 
attempting to translate what cannot be translated, grief and loss, the sea, by putting them all into the same visual form. In doing so, it also makes the journey of the left to die boat personal for Bird Ball, who's equating it to a map of her two homes, London and Geneva, but for her readers as well, who may have ridden on the North Line of the London Underground, or if not, may have had a similar experience on different public transportation, like the CTA. By placing everyday maps alongside the left to die map, Pervoil is, is just juxtaposing the journey of the migrants with everyday travels of Western Europeans and the freedom of movement they enjoy as compared to refugees. The ability to move through space and to rely on the infrastructure of the state as you do so is an unnoticed privilege that emerges through her work. Everyday actions become newly visible and, and negotiable. The next project uh, I'm planning to talk about is Dami Che's DMZ Colony, which won the National Book Award in 2020. Like the previous examples, Che uses maps to interrogate state violence and call attention to the ways in which it continues to affect people today. DMZ Colony comes out of a documentary poetics tradition. Che is documenting experiences of the Korean War and the resulting Korean diaspora. Che was born in Seoul, but left as a young adult to go to school in the US. While much of this book focuses on interviews with South Korean citizens and what it was like for them during the Japanese occupation and the Korean War, it's also about Che's own experience about returning to South Korea as a translator and thinking through what it means to return to a place. This book is made up of memoir, transcripts of interviews, imaginary testimonies, documentary style essays, photos, drawings, and translations. In the first section of the book, Sky Translation, Che begins with a hand-drawn map of the 38th parallel north, which she describes as the waste of a nation. It's followed by five descriptive sentences of the Korean demilitarized zone. The Korean demilitarized zone is approximately 160 miles long and two and a half miles wide. The DMZ runs across the 38th parallel, a division created after World War II with the end of the 35 year long Japanese occupation of Korea. The US occupied the South and the Soviet Union the North. The U.S. still occupies South Korea with military installations, bases, and troops. The Korean border is one of the most militarized borders in the world. The following page abruptly transitions to St. Louis, Missouri, which Che labels as 38.648056 North. Che writes about seeing a flock of geese uh, flying overhead for the first time there as she was on her way to a poetry reading. She describes her ears as a sparrow, that followed the migrating snow geese above. The geese call to Che and she imagines them telling her to return and see you at DMZ. The poem concludes with three traced maps of the geese flight patterns. The first traces their movement with the repeated letter D, seen here on the right. The second, the repeated letter M on the left. And the third, on the right, the repeated letter Z. In bringing these maps in next to the 38th parallel, Che is creating a parallel with the DMZ and the flight patterns of the geese. Geese migrate north and south, and so Che is using them here to invoke the Korean diaspora, which is the central focus of the book that follows. Che writes in the book about the strangeness of feeling like a foreigner as she returns to Korea as a translator. With this opening piece, she is equating that experience with trying to translate geese that she hears for the first time while they are flying away from her. It becomes an, becomes an almost impossible task, and yet it doesn't matter because they are telling her what she already knows, that she will return. By equating the border map with the geese flight patterns, she's suggesting that the DMZ is not as firm a border as it seems, and suggests that as absurd as it is to try to trace geese in mid-flight, it's equally absurd to dry, divide a country in half, and then if you try, it will always elude you. So in my own work, I draw on this varied tradition of mapping and performance to think about intersections of memory and place. And so to conclude, I want to briefly return to my map pieces and talk about how I see them working in the larger context of the manuscript that they are a part of. After making the first map poem in 2016, I began a longer book length project that focused on my relationship to Lake Michigan. Drawing again on fluxus and performance scoring, as well as research into the Great Lakes environmental history, 
The manuscript is part memoir, part environmental history, and part performance score. In bringing these topics together, my goal is to use them to think about the way that we fail, how our memories fail, and how we fail our environments. In some instances, this takes the form of engagement with personal memories of the lake as a child. And in other instances, it engages with endangered species and outdated infrastructure that have led to a decline in the health of the water. For instance, this excerpt from a long poem called The Seaway. The Seaway, a reversal of water filled and emptied by gravity, five canals, 15 locks, most spectacular, Champlain, Eisenhower, Queen Elizabeth, Le Mer Deuce, trade arteries, virtually every commodity imaginable. How the end enters, 200 years, a clear still lake. Drain a swamp, invite an algae bloom. Remove your need to drink. 1835, sea lamprey, Petromyzone marinus. 1873, alewife, Aloso pseudoharangus. 1988, zebra mussel, Dracaena polymorpha. 1989, quagga mussel, Dracaena rostroformis bujensis. 1990, round goby, Neogobius melan melanostomus. Vectors of introduction. What made New York, New York made this too. How do we cut our losses? Find a grave and move through it. Make your own sea. Move through the grave of a lake as if there is no such thing as death. What I remember, sand turned cliff face, the water constantly testing its boundaries, washing my body within it. Brackish ballast, water is heavy enough and easily discarded. Nobody gave it much thought. 1959, the St. Lawrence Seaway will be the greatest single development of the century in its effects on Milwaukee's future growth and prosperity. Modern engineering made obsolete by the container. Vessels outgrew their locks, a vital waterway. By configuring these losses and meditations through the lens of a performance score, like the bathymetric maps, I invite the readers to think of them as evolving rather than static. I want to invite imagination and impossibility into the everyday so that things we accept as permanent, like borders or dying environments, might not seem so permanent one day. And ultimately, the project thinks about human action and hubris, both personal and collective. In inviting that kind of failure into the text, I meditate on how we arrive at knowledge and how knowledge is constantly challenging and evading us. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Thank you so much, Emily, that was great. All right, and can you introduce yourself briefly before your question? Yes, my name is Bill Furlong, and I'm a returning new member, so great to be here again. Uh, very cool. Uh, my question is, where your words were on the depths, is there meaning to where they are based on their depths? I wish the answer is yes, but truthfully, it was just technology. Like, where could I fit? the words the, where they were at least somewhat legible. That's kind of how I chose. Um, yeah, there wasn't any more meaning behind that than that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Bob Holland. Uh, so I'll, I'll say, I was thinking along the lines of Bill, what, you know, what do these lines of depth with the words on them mean? And it came to me, is she trying to, I mean, insofar as poetry might want to bring us, bring some of the elements of our unconscious to the conscious mind, uh, I thought maybe some of the words that are on the deeper contours, she's pointing out, uh, elements of the unconscious and then trying to bring and and they could be in different form when they come up to other contours so i was curious just has has that ever occurred to you that thought ever occurred to you 
Um, you know, it's a good, that's interesting. I hadn't really thought about that. I will say that there were, when I was choosing the language, there were a few things um, that I was thinking about. Um, one was that I wanted there to be a kind of vague instruction that occasionally popped up. So that's why you get some, um, some verbs uh, that just say things like follow. Um, and I was also, I had just finished a, sep a separate, completely separate poem that had this long kind of monologue from a character and that character's voice was still kind of in my head. And so I was like taking some of that still. So you'll get some I statements. So maybe that, that means yes, um, is the answer to your question. Right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm David Marshall, and I'm wondering where in Michigan were you from originally? Okay, because I know some of the places there, Ludington, the ferry, for example, that goes across the lake. And I did not know some of these names as features on the bottom of the lake. And I know that the lake has a, a very deep part where we are is very shallow. It's only about 15 feet near Chicago. Um, so that is interesting to see, like the Ludington Basin and all these others. So, you know, John Cage lived about half a mile from where we are. He lived uh, near Chicago Avenue in the early 1940s. He, had, he was married, and you probably know why his marriage failed, but uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art had an exhibit uh, on his stuff. And some of his things are, what, I think, at Northwestern, I believe. So I was, it was different. So anyhow, thank you. Now they're hard to Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Hale, and uh, I uh, I wanted to um, ask you a little bit about the performance part. Um, I was noticing when you were reading that you were going in a you know around the, the lake in a certain direction. And I was wondering if you could cross and, um, you know, whether you're imagining, you said at one point, like you couldn't have people in the lake because of, I mean, they could tread water and so forth, but like, um, you know, would you imagine different speakers at different points? That's kind of haunting. Um, but, and just is the map of performance, is the poem of performance on top of the map um, you know, maybe the interplay between the the place names and then your words um, suggesting certain performances. Could you talk about that part? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm intentionally trying to keep it very open. Um, I Yeah, I think one of the first people I showed this to they mentioned that the first language that jumps out to you is are the place names, not really my language, um, which I think is great uh, and interesting to me. And it definitely becomes a part of the poem. Um, yeah, the reason why I read it that way is because that's the order of, of how I actually placed it on the map. So in my head, that's what it is. But I think like because it's a circle, you could do all kinds of different things. I don't necessarily have um, a strong vision for how it could be performed, except that I like this idea of constantly moving inward and then being reset and constantly moving inward and being reset. Um, but beyond that, um, yeah, I think of it as being kind of impossible. So I'd be curious if other people wanted to bring their ideas to it. I feel like I'm in the teacher's pet section. Um, I, you know, I, I like the mention of the St. Lawrence Seaway, and I was interested. It would look so different if it was a river or, you know, a canal or something that moves in one direction to another. Have you ever thought about how you would translate this sort of mapping to, you know, something that's not Lake Michigan, where it has a cyclical flow? Mm 
So I actually have a poem that mentions the Erie Canal. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I haven't thought about it, but I'm interested in it now, especially because like, even though the lakes look very contained, they're really not, they're like, constantly moving and that was uh, my original vision was to do something like this for the in all of the lakes but um it seemed like too much by the time I actually got to it um so I, I stopped with Lake Michigan um but I think that would be like an interesting way to bring that in because once you start with the lakes then it's like why, where do you stop like you would go out there's so many places where they drain or where they if water comes in um yeah, I would be really interested in thinking about that, but I don't have a great answer for you. <laughs> <laughs>